Now remember what we read back in Isaiah, the second chapter, about many nations. Verse 4, he shall judge among the nations and rebuke many people, okay, because they haven't submitted to the government of God, to the kingdom of God, which shows what? God, at the beginning, gives them a choice. What are you going to do? The kingdom of God is established in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ, the Almighty God, is king. And all the sons and daughters of God are going to be ruling under him, bringing peace to the world but you must come of your own accord. Now, if you don't come, I'll give you plenty of time, but then you're going to wish that you had come in the first place. Rebuke nations afar off. Let's see that. Let's begin right here in Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog in the land of Magog and the chief ruler of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, and the chief ruler of Rosh and Meshech and Tubal. That's all the nations north and east of the Holy Land. Isn't it amazing that they will choose not to submit? But sooner or later, God will make them submit. So let's see what they do. Remember, Israel is there. It's plenteous. They have great crops. Everything is peaceful, and we don't know how many years it may be, but it may be up to seven years before this event occurs with Gog and Magog and all the rest of the, of the nations listed. I'm against you, verse 4, and I will turn you back and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, your horses and horsemen, and all of them clothed most gorgeously, a great assembly with buckler and shield, and all of them swordmen. Persia, which is Iran, so it's going clear back that way. Ethiopia, this is probably India, because there's Kush and Foot, and Foot are the straight-haired Ethiopians of India and Libya with them, and all of them with shields and helmet, and Gomor and all of his bands, the house of Togarma, from the uttermost parts of the north, way up there in Siberia. And all his bands, and many people with you, be prepared, yea, prepare for yourselves, you and all your assembly, and all that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days, Notice that. Many days. Could that be seven years? Don't know. Ring the bell. Okay. You will be summoned. In the latter years you shall come into the land restored from war, gathered out of many people. That's Israel at peace. On the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but she has been brought out of the nations, and she shall dwell securely, all of them. And you shall go up, coming like a storm, and you shall be like a cloud to cover the land, you and all your bands and many people with you. Because they're going to come up against the cities of Israel. I'm sure that they have sent spies up there to check it out. And they look at it, look, it's prosperous. Look at all that they have. 
and they don't have any fortifications. There are no armies. There are no swordsmen. There are no bowmen. Look at how easy this is going to be because the aliens that have taken over have made it prosper. But we will go take it back from them. That's probably will be their thinking. I'll ring the bell again, okay? All right, verse 10. Thus says the Lord, and it shall be in that day that things shall come into your heart, and you shall devise an evil plan. And you will say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to those that are at rest, who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls. And there are no bars nor gates to them in order to take a spoil and to steal a prize, prize and to turn your hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations who have gotten cattle and goods and who dwell in the midst of the land. Now notice there will be other nations who will see this developing and they will ask, well, what are you doing? Let's read it. Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all her villages shall say to you, Have you come to take a spoil? Have you gathered your company to steal a prize? To carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Even the nations gave them a warning. Don't do this. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwell securely, you shall know it. And you shall come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many people with you and all of them riding on horses, a great company, a mighty army. And you shall come upon my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land, and it shall be in the latter days. And I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I shall be sanctified in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Now this is the last great war after the millennium has started. God has given all those nations a chance to repent. All those nations to come to Jerusalem and ask for the government to be brought to them. Those are the nations that are the strong nations afar off that God is going to rebuke and we're going to see how he's going to do it. And it is going to be a climactic thing that is going to be absolutely marvelous. And I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I shall be sanctified in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by the hand of my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them. And it shall come to pass at that same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, my hot anger will be aroused and my jealousy in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great quaking in the land of Israel. Now this is going to be quite an event. So that the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and the beast of the field and all the creeping things that creep on the earth and all the men on the face of the earth shall quake at my presence. They are going to know that this was the hand of God. 
and there will be no further rebellion in the world again. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him upon all my mountains, says the Lord God. Each man's sword shall be against his brother. Just like it was with the Assyrians when God saved Hezekiah and Jerusalem and Judah from the Assyrians. The army of 180,000 died. This time, God is going to have them kill each other. Put them in mass confusion. They won't know what they're doing. Verse 22, And I will judge him with pestilence and with blood, and I will reign upon him and upon his bands and upon many people with him, and overflowing shower, and great hailstones, fire and brimstone, doesn't God always use those things in his battle? Now stop and think about it. Even the greatest, most sophisticated weapons of men can never go against the weapons of God. Never. Verse 23, Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will have myself known in the eyes of of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now notice what it says in chapter 39. Because this final battle is going to settle it once and for all. That the kingdom of God and the government of God is going to rule for a thousand years. Chapter 39. Therefore, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O God, O Gog, the chief ruler of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you about and will lead you on, and I will bring you up from the uttermost parts of the north. And I will bring you against the mountains of Israel, and I will strike your bow out of your hand, and will cause your arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your bands, and the people with you. And I will give you for food to the birds of prey of every kind, and to the beast of the field. See, they didn't learn the lesson when Christ reigned returned with the saints at the Battle of Armageddon. They should have learned the lesson. But you see, of the armies of 200 million, not all of them were there in the Holy Land. There were still a lot of them way back in the countries to the east and to the north. And those are part of the armies that are going to be activated again and come seven years later against Israel. And you shall fall upon the face of the open field, verse 5, for I have spoken it, says the Lord God. And I will send a fire on Magog, on those who dwell in the isles, and, those, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. And Israel is going to know even more. See, see, every human being is going to know God rules. Now, are you going to choose to submit in love and worship to God so you receive love back from him and blessings back from him? Or are you, you think you're going to come and take it from the children of Israel that I brought back from captivity and set yourself up again. So let's read it. Verse 7, And I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. This is going to be profound. 
okay? Behold, it is coming, it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of the Lord which I have spoken. And the inhabitants of the cities of Israel shall go out and shall set on fire and burn the weapons and the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the javelins and spears, and they shall burn them for fire with fire seven years. Think of what a mammoth battle that this is going to be. See, after Christ returns, and they're still back over here in the east and in the, in, in the north, okay, they're going to be making their weapons. They're going to be preparing. Now, they're not going to have all the technical things that, that they used to have, but they're going to have horses, and they're going to have all kinds of animals, and they're going to come. Okay? This is going to be fantastic, all right? Verse 10, so that they shall take no wood out of the field, nor cut down any of the forest, for they shall make fires of, of the weapons. And they shall plunder those who plundered them, and rob those who robbed them, says the Lord God. And it shall be in that day that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea. It shall block off those who pass by, and they shall bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of the multitudes of Gog. Now this is going to be an absolutely fantastic battle, epic proportion, that is going to solidify everything on earth under the government and power of God. But remember, he always gives choice to repent. But they wouldn't repent. Instead, they said, we're going to continue in the way that we have been. And we're, and they probably sent spies down there to spy it out and look it over, as it says, chapter 37. And they would pick a time that they thought would be good. But it will actually be the time that God determined to bring them down to the valley here and destroy them completely. Verse 12, And the house of Israel shall bury them, to cleanse the land seven months, and all the people of the land shall bury them, and shall be to them a day of renown, the day that shall be glorious, says the Lord. I wonder, will that be on the Feast of Trumpets? Hmm. And they shall employ men to continually search the land, burying those who remain on the face of the earth to cleanse it, and at the end of seven months, they shall begin the search. And as those who pass by through the land pass through, if any man sees a bone, he shall set a sign behind it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of the multitude of God. And also the name of the city there is multitude. Thus they shall cleanse the land. And you shall say, Son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to the birds of every kind and of every beast of the field. Gather yourselves and come. Gather yourselves all around to my sacrifice that I sacrifice for you, a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel so that you may eat the flesh and drink blood. And you shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, lambs, goats, bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And you shall eat fat until you are full and drink blood until you are drunk of my sacrifice, which I have sanctified for you. And you shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots and with mighty men and all men of war, says the Lord God. Now notice how this ends. 
This is quite something. See? And I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations shall see my judgments, which I have exercised, and my hand that I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. There will be no doubt. And the nation shall know that the house of Israel was exiled for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore I hid my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies and they fell by the sword. Okay. Then it goes back and repeats some other things. But that's quite a thing. Quite a fight. Quite a battle. Now, let's see what happens after that. All the nations now are going to submit. Now, let's read some of the Psalms and see how that's going to be. Now, let's come to Psalm 85. Psalm 85. This is a wonderful psalm. And this explains the whole atmosphere, the whole attitude, the whole, how shall we say, spiritual power that will flow from God to bring this to the whole world. Psalm 85 and verse 9. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, and all the world at that time will fear him and know him, so that glory may dwell in our land. Now notice this. Mercy and truth have met together. And that's what salvation is all about. Mercy and truth. And the truth of the government of God and the power of the kingdom of God through the saints on the earth will be known. And this is what we will administer. Mercy and truth. Continuing. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That's quite a... I, I love those verses. This is fantastic. Verse 11. Truth shall spring out of the earth. It's going to be everywhere. No more lies. No more deception. No more schemes. Only the truth of God. And why... He's created us. And what is his plan? And where are we going? And what is being done? Okay. And righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. That sets the whole attitude for once on the earth. Okay? Psalm 93. A lot of these psalms are really quite important right here in this section concerning the rule of God on earth. See, if there's any one thing or two things that Satan is totally confused and men do not have right is number one, the truth about God. They have their own religions. And number two, the truth about what kind of real godly government there needs to be. And that is those who are the sons and daughters of God who will deal in kindness, who will deal in love, who will deal in truth, to help people with their lives. And God's blessing will be everywhere. On everything that they do. Everything that is in their lives. And how their children are. And how their animals are. Etc. Okay. Psalm 93 and verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. And we will be clothed with majesty too, won't we? Yes. The Lord is clothed with strength. He clothed himself, and the world also is established 
it shall not be moved. Your throne is established of old, yea, you are everlasting. Isn't that something? It's going to go on. What did we say in where we first started? And of his government and peace, there shall be no end. O oh Lord, the floods have lifted up their voices. The floods have lifted up their waters. The Lord on high is mightier than the thunders of many waters. Yea, mightier than the mighty waves of the sea. Your testimonies are very sure. Holiness adorns your house forever, O oh Lord. Back to the tabernacle that will be there by day and night. Now let's come to let's come to Psalm 96. Psalm 96. These show the millennium. Psalm 96. Verse 1. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Is that going to be something? Think of what it's going to be like on the Sabbath day. Think what it's going to be like when there will be everything perfect. Let's read it. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. Everyone's going to know. That's an amazing thing to contemplate. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Well, there won't be any gods, false gods, okay? But there will be us who will be smaller gods, as it were. Verse 6. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O kindreds of the people. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Oh, you can just imagine the things that will be said, what people will be doing, how their lives will be. Oh, tremendous. Ascribe to the Lord glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And we will understand what that means at that time. The beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. And the world shall be established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the people with righteousness. Doesn't that tie in with many of the things that we've already read? Yes, indeed. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be glad in all that is in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Now, I don't know how that's going to be, but that's going to be something, isn't it? Before the Lord... For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and his people with his truth. Magnificent indeed, isn't it? Yes, indeed, this is tremendous, brethren. What God has for us after that final, final war, everything, everywhere is going to be perfect. It is going to be righteous. It is going to be good. And the people will all be taught of God, from the least to the greatest, from the small to the large, everywhere. Now, Psalm 97. Here it continues, see. Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the islands be glad. Clouds and darkness are all around him. Righteousness and judgment are the foundation of his throne or his government. And it's going to be in love, in truth, in faith, in righteousness, everything about God. 
Okay. Verse 9. For you, O Lord, are high above all the earth. You are exalted high above all gods. Now, if that refers to us, that may be true. But we don't know, so we can't say that definitely for sure. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Well, there won't be much wickedness then, because here's what's going to be. Light and truth of God's way is going to be everywhere. Verse 11. Light is sown in righteousness and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones, and praise his holy name. Wonderful. All about the millennium. See, even though today people have the law of sin and death in them, and even though that they have a nature that is contrary to God, down deep inside, what we have just read is what they yearn for. They don't know how to get it. It's not there in the world today. It's not in the churches, it's not in the religion, it's not in the governments, it's not anywhere on the face of the earth. Pray tell, let's hope it's with the churches of God. May it be so that we can set an example for the world. Okay. Psalm 98. Isn't it interesting how these flow one right into the other? Sing to the Lord a new song, for he's done marvelous things. Yes. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. And that final battle finally convinces them that that is the way to go. Now let's continue right on here in verse 4. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth and rejoice and sing praise. Sing to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre, with the voice of a psalm. With silver trumpets, the sound of a ram's horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and the fullness of it the world and those who dwell in it. See, this is a worldwide fantastic thing that's going to take place. And this is why we are here at the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is why God has called us. He's, he hasn't called us just to be better people in the world. He hasn't called us so that we can be nice, nicey, nice folks. He has called us to learn his way so we can help him rule the world in love and in truth and in righteousness. That's what it is. And as spirit beings, to be his spirit sons and daughters. There can't be anything greater than that. Verse 8, let the floods clap hands, let the mountains sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth with righteousness. He shall judge the world and the people with equity. Amazing thing, isn't it? Now, let's come to Psalm 99. Notice how these all flow together to give us a fantastic picture of what it's going to be like in the millennium. Verse 1, Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He sits between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all the people. Let them praise your name as great and awesome. Holy is he. The strength of the king also loves justice. He establishes uprightness. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. And all of this involves us. Now it talks about Moses and Aaron is with him, but that also means all the other saints, all of us. Okay? Now, 
Let's finish right here with Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Another psalm about the greatness of God, the rule of God, the kingdom of God, and all the saints with him to bring this about. Verse 1. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Now think about what that's going to be when all the earth does that. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Yes, everybody's going to be doing a lot of singing. And in other places, they're also going to have a lot of wine. Know that the Lord, he is God. Everyone's going to know that from the least to the greatest. He has made us. Isn't that amazing thing? Think of what God has done to create people. Male and female coming together, one flesh. And their children are truly the one flesh of mother and father. And to have that, that's so fantastic, brethren. And think what it's going to be like during the millennium. Okay? We are his, we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter in at his gates with thanksgiving. Come into his courts with praise. Give thanksgiving to him and bless his name. And everything that he has, and everything that he does, and everything that he has made for us. And think about the fantastic thing it's going to be for us to bring this to the whole world. That is the solution. Okay? Now let's finish with verse 5. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures to all generations. That is the whole thrust of what the earth and the world and people are going to be during the millennium.